Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. This episode of the Marco Martins Revolution is brought to you by Vodcast TV, Johannesburg's premier shared podcast studio platform. If you've ever wanted to host your own podcast for yourself or your business, uh, there's just simply never been a better place to do it than right here. If you want a podcast that looks, sounds, and maybe feels something similar to this one, head on over to vodcasttv.com forward slash revolution and get yourself a discount on your first order of a podcast or a podcast series. My guest today, Google and Corsi. Oh, what a great time we had last time on the podcast. And I've got him back again. He's a voiceover artist. He's a creative entrepreneur. He's an actor. He's a I don't know. He does solar energy space. Hit me up. (laughs) Damn. Uh, Yeah, he's doing things. Yeah, what's happening? Let's get into the show. A revolution is a fundamental and relatively sudden change in political power. An organization which occurs when the population revolts. The Marco Martins Revolution, powered by Vodcast TV. Visit VodcastTV.com for more. Yeah, thanks for having me, buddy. Google, you're welcome, dude. Thank you so much for stopping by. We had such a good response from our last podcast. We were quite impassioned about men's mental health and, mm. and what men should do and, and how... Uh, the the greater requirements of society is for men to get healthy and mm. there's so many things in our way at the moment one of the things that i brought up last time was some stats in terms of mental health practitioners and how few of them they are to handle a mental health crisis in south africa he has a stat right here south africa has a 12-month prevalence estimate of 16.5 percent for common mental health disorders like anxiety mood and substance use disorders with almost a third of the population having experienced a common mental health disorder in their lifetime these estimates are relatively high when compared to international prevalence estimates of the world health organization world mental health surveys Uh, As is the case internationally, the treatment gap in South Africa is also high, with only one in four people with a common mental health disorder receiving treatment of any kind. This is all via the NHI in the United States, uh, their National Library of Medicine. The website is nbci.nlm.nih.gov, and it's an article that you will find on there. So massive prevalence even when compared to the rest of the world so when you look statistically uh, at a broad picture one of the things that stands out to me here in terms of making a bit of an argument is we have a big alcohol consumption country so that might sway the numbers in a way where we have massive substance use disorders um, which isn't necessarily an observation around mental health in a large way but maybe some way that we need to discourage the the uh, abnormal or great use of alcohol mm. so i think that might push the numbers but still at the end of the day very concerning to see us having abnormally high uh, levels of mental health compared to the rest of the world and one in four people with a common mental health disorder receiving treatments of any kind. Yeah, man. Um, you know, I guess this is why they say hindsight's twenty twenty, Because when you look at a country like South Africa that's got the traumatic history that it does, mm. right? From, I, obviously... We're talking apartheid. We're talking about the victims yes. of apartheid. There's mm-hmm. going to be, you know, all kinds of... <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be all kinds of, um, you know, uh, psychological trauma. Now, imagine you, you watched your father get taken out of the house and you're a child, right? Mm. Your father's dragged out of the house. Your mother's beaten by the police in front of you. That doesn't stop overnight. And then you take a collective 
uh, 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 mass populace who share that trauma, who share that that experience. But then on the flip side, right? Even the perpetrators, their children, and their children's children have to deal with the guilt of what their fathers or their grandfathers did. So psychologically, on both sides, there's shit that needs to be done, work that needs to be done, people that need healing. Mm. So hindsight being 2020, maybe we should have invested, the government should have invested more in the, 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 the healing of the people from a psychological side of mm. things to say what's happened here is really just so traumatic and 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 chaotic in order for our people to proceed and to progress there should be at the very least systems in place yes we need to put that in mm. in, in place or right? at least seeing some intention to have systems in place where there's clearly um obviously with the uh South African equivalent of an NHI being discussed, which yep. I think is critical, especially. 100%. Um, however, I can understand people's concern with an NHI coming into practice when you look at failing SOEs like ESCOM, SAA, all of these examples about, oh, great, another, um, another state capture opportunity but- for government. But in saying that, it's definitely a critical conversation and mental health needs to be part of this critical conversation. So how do we allow a sort of national health insurance to not be robbed, to not be used (sighs) as a thing, but create one so that the average poor South African who can't afford healthcare gets mental health and physical healthcare. So that's, uh, I just want to go through a little calculation I made. Our population is nearing 60 million people in South Africa. If one third, close to 20 million, has experienced some mental health disorder across the span of a year, and only one in four receive treatment for that, that means that three in four of those people experiencing, it's approximately 15 million South Africans who have a mental disorder or have experienced some sort of mental disorder that have received no treatment at all for it. That's 15 million people, 15 million people who are walking around with a mental disorder that have received no treatment for it whatsoever, according to those stats. That's a quick calculation on my side. It's close to 50, according to a quick calculation. And you know it's more. Uh, It's it's quite possibly more. So especially when you take substance abuse into account with that, Uh, I think that the number's greater. But it's extremely concerning 15 million people. and, And I think that then translates even further into the requirement of an NHI or some sort of mental health aid or assistance either from the private sector to assist South Africa in having it, because it's obviously great for future business to have a healthy, mentally healthy country. Yes. Um, or government, who we most expectant of to do it. However, we, <laughs> you know, good luck, good luck for the day that it comes. But look, this is why, you know, saying hindsight being 2020. <clears throat> if this was, had been implemented, you know, back then, then the question is, would we be seeing the kind of corruption that we're seeing now? Right? Hopefully not. So, Mm. Now where we are, because we can't, you know, hop on, but the past, there's nothing we can do to change that. Where we where we are and your question about, you know, an NHA-like setup mm. and how would that work and government, uh, man, I don't know. I think, look, we've got medical aids, right? And most medical aids don't actually cater to, to, to mental health. No, that's also true. That's a very good so uh, observation. Is maybe that if you have a basic medical aid service, like I have very basic medical, I have a hospital plan, what they call a hospital mm. plan here, um, which covers me of the extreme private hospital expenses, but yeah. doesn't allow me general day to day medical health care oh, yeah, cover. Gotta, you still got to pay. Uh, you still got to pay out your pocket for that. Which even on some of the bigger medical aid schemes, you will still have to pay out your pocket for optometry mental health is included in that same sort of bracket as optometry in, in so, a lot of ways. So there's like one medical aid that I know of that does cover some form of medical, a uh, mental aid. Name and brag. Give them some credit. Comp care. 
Comke. Yeah. Well done to you. Right? Not really. It's the not biggest in depth or the biggest. There, yeah. But Comke do offer some sort of cover for, for, for mental health. Well done to you. And Comke. I'm like, why don't you as a medical aid then create a policy that you can have people sign up just for mental health? And there you get 24-hour access to free therapy whatever it is because mm. you do have people like lifeline you know you've got you've got ngos like lifeline which mm. is a free um mental therapy, health telephone right service, yeah correct? you can yep. whatsapp and everything i've uh. used it i used it last year during um uh when we went into level four you couldn't go to so it was the return anything. to level four yeah. during last year's last delta year. variant or something along yes. those lines yeah Right, so level four couldn't go anywhere. Plus, I'm strapped for cash. Therapists are not cheap. Mm -mm. And so I uh, came across Lifeline. Someone posted about Lifeline on Instagram. And I was like, great. Took Lifeline. And shout out to Mickey. She's the woman that helped me. And um, we then went on a four-month journey where at the time I had some suicidal ideations going on, man. So mm. that helped. But the reality is, is even with Lifeline, they, they rely on like donations to keep going and they don't have that many therapists. So maybe one of the things that government could do to aid, right, mm. is encourage students to start applying for bursaries or, or, or scholarships but steering you more into the direction of um, psychology. Mm. So this is like a full, you can go on encourage, a full scholarship. Encourage the qualification yes. of mental health practitioners. You right? can get a full scholarship, full mm. ride, mm. right? As long as that's your practice, as long as that's your... Story. As long as you go and study psychology. As mm. long as you, at the end, come out a qualified therapist, we will pay for everything. Mm. And I think that that should be part Look, of the I priority. think from an, from an economic standpoint, uh, the, the fees must fall movement was massively important um, in terms of the conversation they were starting. How government goes about doing that, who knows. Um, but you look at the example of countries like Sweden who have reaped the benefits of a decision made in the 1970s to educate their population. Uh, and they, they've they reaped massive taxation benefits. They're far better off for it by educating their population for free. They have a more qualified population who earns greater income, both domestically and internationally, and then pays higher taxes because of the greater income earned by the educated population. So they have much bigger tax revenue. That's the second trolley into a window here yeah. uh, during this podcast. Well, just so that people know gents. that we're not laughing at, at the actual yeah, topic. At, yeah, because it's absolutely hysterical mental health. Um, yeah. But let's get into a little bit of what we've been talking about because we can really go on a rant here and there, you and I, and mm. I... I find it really <laughs> difficult to bring myself in line, let alone you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you did say that you are facing suicidal thoughts. And I think one of the things that that many of us can agree on is that it's extremely hard to be alive sometimes. It's one of the hardest things you can do is just be alive to your day to day. Yeah. And, <laughs> and there's this, when you get into the depressed state and, and you've said this idea that you've, find suicide enticing when you're in that suicidal mm. state there's this romanticization that you have there's a romantic idea of suicide and how yeah. you you can you often find that in that point of view people bargain with themselves on it it's like you start giving yourself the pros about suicide like yeah uh, I, well first of all i'll no longer feel the pain that i feel Oh, Second yeah. of all, I'll no longer disappoint those around me or mm. my loved ones, things mm, like that. Mm, mm. If you have some sort of life insurance covers, like if I died now, my family would be set, like their homes would be paid off or whatever, you know, something yeah. along those lines is that if you have some sort of financial incentive towards your suicide well, if you've got as the well, policy that does actually cover, a lot of these guys lot, don't cover that. Which I suppose makes sense, yeah. right? But uh, many, like beyond the, the suicide itself is just the, the, romantic, the romanticization of death mm. in general is mm. that it's like there's a financial incentive towards the ones you would leave behind or... The, you yeah. know, there's a lot of romanticizing that we do when you're in a, the space of suicidal thought. Yeah, look, because, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, too morbid 
things. Mm. So I used to make this joke back in the day. And like I realized that even when I first made that joke, I was very clearly depressed, right? Because I didn't actually think I was depressed at the time. But I always used to say, if I die, I'm going to die one of two ways. AIDS or suicide. <laughs> Stuck, I know. <laughs> Choosing some sexy... Sexy big death no, ideas really, it's, there, it's, it's, right? It's, really, it's, it's not like some normal shit. It's really dark. But and meanwhile, we'll probably die from motor accident or heart man, disease. Like yo, like, <laughs> That's, I, I'll be happy 80, 85. Uh, you know, I'll start smoking crack and then I'll die of crack overdose. Joking, joking. But I used to make that joke. I used to say, "Don't joke." Listen, <laughs> if you're eighty-five and you want to start smoking crack. Now's your time. Uh, like, I don't blame yeah, anyone. Yeah, yeah. You don't have a future to fuck up. <laughs> Smoke some. You're 85, dude. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. Bad, this is my bad advice segment, but it is a bad <laughs> I'm advice. I'm joking, but I'm not. But like, like, for real. I'm like, if I get 85, dude, bro. I'm not even mad. Then if I'm you're like, doing crystal no, and you're 85, man, do it. it. Heroin and do man. it. I'll smoke it do all. Do it. Right? There's this song called Party Time by, by oh, I forget the name. Now. It's I too British. don't recommend hardcore drugs yeah. in, in your 20s no, no, or your 30s no, or your 40s, 40s. 50s. But if you're 85. No, there's, there's this song. There's this song called Party Time with these two British topies. The names will come to me. And they, they're like in their late 60s, 70s. And the guy even talks about like how his wife's kicked him out the house. And, you know, he wakes up to a bowl of cocaine and he tried crack and now he's like addicted. I mean, like they're joking, I hope, but and they're really good at rapping. Mm. But I'm like, you know what? At your age, like, if, you know, you're bordering on 70 or whatever. Personally, like I said, I'd still get to like 80, 85. I'm like, yeah, there's not much that, you know, like. Statistically, how many people are good at rapping that have never smoked crack? Shit, I don't know. <laughs> Most. I think a lot of good rappers that you think like, especially if you're into old school rap, those guys did crack. No, look, most of them. Maybe not heavy not, users, not but like crack. Okay. But like, you know, I know some of my, my favorite rappers have done coke. I'm just like, yeah. But anyway, let's get back to the whole thing. Of, <laughs> so yeah. the suicide thing, right? Mm. I, I, um, like I said, I'd make this joke about, yo, you know, uh, if I had to die, it would be AIDS or suicide. And the most suicidal that I've ever been, I had a mental breakdown. 2007, like I lost, to, actually no, December 2006, mm. going into 2007. I've been smoking like nobody's business. I don't know what the fuck happened. The chemical imbalance. Uh, I guess that's why they say everything in moderation. And I just, my, I could feel something snap. And over time, I'm hearing voices and... I can't sleep. Mm. I would literally go to sleep at two and be up at four. And I'd sit on the edge of my bed and I'd like rock back and forth. And the one time my cousin, you know, he's there, he, he slept over and he catches me and I'm going on like, Bukhle doesn't live here, Bukhle doesn't live here, right? And I'm just generally, I'm just like eroding and I'm fucking out. And eventually the thing is, is, is to express everything, I couldn't. I couldn't mm. actually talk about what was going on inside my head. But there were these pockets where I'd be like, this can't be my life. Mm. Is this my life? Like, I couldn't hold a, 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 a thought for more than a minute before I start thinking really fucked up shit. And it got to a point where I, I just broke down. Mm. I went out with my cousins. And I'm tr I was trying to put on a brave face. And we, it was New Year's Day. Yes, New Year's Eve. Sorry, 2006. And we went to a friend's girlfriend's house. And she had like a fish tank filled with uh, pure ginseng. And I drank half the tank mm. by myself. Don't ever do that. Mm -mm. that I doesn't sound like a good idea. fucked out. So now it's like in the morning. We leave, we go back to my cousin's house, and I'm starting to lose it. All right, there's a song from a rap group called Little Brother with uh, DJ Drama, Gangster, Chris Eels. And the song starts with Shooby Dooby Dooby Doo, Gangster Grills is coming for you. I repeated that line like a broken record for 30 minutes, maybe more. My two cousins, 
were like at the beginning laughing and then it was like dude this isn't funny mm. so my cousin whose house we were at Sveso he was like nah I'm taking you home I'm not cut out to deal with what's happening so we get back to my parents place and it's now me and my other cousin Zoeli get into the house as soon as we walk into the house something happens to me man like I don't know what it was but I lost it so I go upstairs cuz didn't I still had the, the presence of mind to be like I don't want my parents to see me like this mm. so I go upstairs and I go to the guest bedroom my sister at the time staying with us and my nephew who's at the time maybe 4 months old and I'm sitting in the room with her and I go through three different emotions right and it's like just zigzag I'm laughing I'm crying I'm quiet I'm quiet I'm crying I'm laughing and it just switch and my sister i remember she's like sitting there with me and she's laughing when i'm laughing and then i start crying and then she start crying cuz she's freaking out my dad came in he didn't know what to do my mom came in she didn't know what to do they gave me fucking some pills or what not you know and i'm just I'm, i'm i'm flipping out man i'm having like this moment where i'm like I can't take this anymore. It's been weeks. I've been quiet, but I guess the ginseng did something that triggered mm. something, right? And I was like, Mm-mm, this can't be life. There's no ways I'm trying to live like this. Mm. So I went to my parents' room and I pulled out my dad's gun. I knew where it was. So I put it in my mouth, cocked in everything. Something said, dude, you can't fucking do this. like your sisters in the room with mm. your nephew mm. and your parents at the stairs you're going to leave them with brain matter in their bedroom that's that's what they've got to deal with your brain fragments your brain in their bedroom that's the only reason why I didn't pull the trigger I was like I felt guilty mm. and thank god I didn't after that I've had other moments where I felt suicidal and there's a, 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 a some sultry sexy thing about it for me at least but I recognize and I'm grateful that I've been able to get to a point now where I'm like no it, I'll never say it's the coward's way out because man that shit's scary Mm. I've having been in that position there was a, a second time where you know I had a um, razor to my wrist but the thought of actually pulling like executing mm. it like you know carrying through with it is scary so what keeps me going now is no you're not doing anyone a favor Mm. you're not you're not making life easier for anybody because if you think that you are a burden now mm. just try and picture the burden that you are leaving them with knowing that they weren't able to help you mm. and these are the people that do love you you know so those are the things that have kept me going and quit drinking mm and that made a big difference for you huge i think that alcohol is a good tool for very specific people i think it's overly used i think that alcohol is consumed massively widely and it's not required by most people i have found myself sitting at a table with new people in a social situation and you find a single individual who's extremely quiet at the beginning and then a few drinks come in and they're able to socialize so i think it's a excellent social lubricant for people who have social anxiety who can't immediately express themselves whereas i tend to not have that difficulty i imagine you don't either we massively conversational human no, beings you see me drunk <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you talk way more which is which is saying something and i um, get a bit out of hand but uh, in saying that uh, you you said that there's this connotation of it being the coward's way out of suicide i think people put the mark of suicide on that very famous scene from the shawshank redemption spoilers if you haven't seen a movie from 
94. Okay. Like, yeah. An old your ass fault. movie. It's, your <laughs> fault. it's been on Netflix for a long time yeah, as your well. Fault at this point. Like um, where the warden of the prison gets caught out for his schemes and scams, his illegal dealings. So as the police are coming, approaching to arrest him, he kills himself. Mm. There is your one example of suicide yeah. being a coward's way yeah. out, right? Is that he's not willing to face the consequences of his actions, so he kills himself. Like the story of Hitler committing suicide. The one, you know? another coward's way out of you know facing and accepting the responsibilities of your actions. So those are perhaps the only terms that you can call suicide a coward's way out. Anyone who's actually struggled with the idea of suicide knows- From a mental health aspect. From a mental health aspect, just how difficult it is. It's extremely difficult. And I think Uh, that's what, sorry, I think mm, that's what has perpetuated the narrative of suicide being the coward's way out. Like they took Mm. those dynamics. Maybe. And then it just kind of, people just ran with it. It was like, yeah, Yeah. it's the the coward's way out. And maybe those who were even feeling a little angry and aggrieved from a loved one, you know, taking their life, it's Mm. like, uh, you know, they they took the coward's way out. Why couldn't they speak to me or whatever? Yeah. But it's not. Yeah, I think like maybe, maybe it stems from people like using financial debt uh, they're in massive amounts of debt. They're literally drowning in debt because that's what it feels like when you're in terrible amounts. You literally feel like you're drowning, you're gasping for air when you're in massive amounts of debt and then they kill themselves and it's a coward's way out because you've not been able to face yeah, the financial debt. But mental health is a reality. The actual action of suicide, and I don't want to romanticize the idea anymore, uh, we've just been talking about how you can romanticize the idea and make suicide sexy. Is that? Uh, but it takes a great amount of bravery to actually overcome the basic survival urge of a human being. Yeah, uh, you know, there's the very few species of animal that commit suicide, and human beings, it's a very prominent. Uh, so it shows an illness in society, I believe. But uh, for you to overcome that desire to live is the instinct the instinct to live even better is tremendous yeah it's tremendously difficult to live is instinctual like absolutely <laughs> it, it's the the single most instinctual thing it's where across the board it's where anxiety stems from in many ways is the the desire to survive Oh, I'm scared of heights. Yes, because you have a fear of death from falling from a great natural. height. And it might be yeah. something that you inherit from predecessors. There's uh, anthropologists who believe that the genetic fear of heights stems from people who lived in mountainous regions and they will have fallen from cliffs. And it's something that was inherited in your genetic code that like stay away from cliffs because mm, you will die. Very interesting. Uh, arachnophobia could stem from people whose ancestors lived in regions with venomous spiders. And that's why you have this irrational fear of spiders in general, is that it's something that you may have inherited genetically from your ancestors due to venomous spiders. So it's a really cutesy idea. I don't know how many people have proven it wrong at this point. It's probably there. But I like the idea. I like the concept of you inheriting these anxieties or these phobias from your predecessors through reality, through real danger. And now you have this false perceived danger and that's why you develop a phobia an irrational fear of certain things well shared trauma is real you know south africa is suffering from shared trauma aren't oh we? yeah and that's why another thing that i used to say as a joke which now more and more i'm like actually i don't think south africans are meant to date each other hmm i have seen very happy americans with south africans and vice versa no, I, Maybe like, it works. I, I, I don't know if we're meant to date each other because there's just way too much shared trauma. And I think it's in that way you've got men expecting women to be empathetic and sympathetic. You've got the woman expecting the men to be empathetic and sympathetic. And then on top of that, you still got, you know, the ridiculous rate of GBV and rape on, you know, and... Th- financial crisis, Mm. the corruption, everything that we're going through. And I think the shared trauma, it it has us at a point where we're almost apathetic to the other's issues, right? Whereas if I'm with somebody from Angola, Mm. 
yes, she's got her traumas. She's got, you know, things that she's experienced from personal individual to societal country, right? Mm. Cultural. But it's not what I've gone through. So there'll be that 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 middle ground that will allow us to almost have space to be empathetic, you know, to be like, oh, damn, this is what you've gone through. These are the trials and tribulations that your people have faced. Because I just, I look at, you know, the, the, the way things are going and I, I, I don't know, I think we're, we're maybe just not meant to date, you know, by and large, not everyone, but I'd, I'd say a good number of us just not meant to date each other. I think that... Um a lot of compatible couples share a lot of cultural interests, right? Um, it, not that people can't cross culture and, and have a happy relationship, but I think having some sort of formative years relativity, and I think it's why people uh, have such success dating their same age, especially in our generation where we had such formative things that was like growing up in the 90s. Oh, I watched Power Rangers. I watched Power Rangers, just like silly little shit things like that help, I think, with compatibility in a way. But in saying that, I don't think it's absolute. I think there's other more important factors mm. than these relative little strands of, of uh, cultural connectivity. Yeah. And I think that it's obviously a lot more your true ideals are more important. Like I have family values. I value my family greatly. And then if you don't, that's a clashing point. And like I the, think, the hardcore ideals and I are think more this, important. I think this ties back nicely to the whole thing of mental health in that when I read this stat, I think it's from 2019, 2020, that 32% of children have very little to no relationship with their father and almost 60% of mothers are single parents mm -hmm. or, or women are single parents. In which country? In SA. Here. Um, check it out. Just type in um, single parent stats South Africa and there should be an article from like 2019, 2020, and, you know, 32%, yeah, 32, mm. 32%. Kids don't know their, their fathers. And that's the thing, you know, is there, there's, there's a, there, there are a myriad of, of issues that have played into the mental health dynamic of this country, you know, going back, apartheid to everything else that has that has happened and i think for men because we are men and we can't really speak for the woman um it's it it, it starts with the other point you know that 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 i wanted to touch on which is don't use your depression as a as as a way to avoid taking accountability for your actions so just to interrupt there, I, I agree before we go into the uh, a stat from Many Shades of Fatherhood in SA, genderjustice.org.za. I don't know how reliable they are, but anyway, the co-residence data from Statistics South Africa shows that 36% of children live with their biological fathers in the same household, 34% with both biological parents, and 2% with their biological fathers only. So that's a really small percentage of uh, people, children, human beings who who have lived with only their father <laughs> a, as a father figure. It's very, very small. Uh, according to the General Household Survey in 2019, households' composition are shaped by the residential patterns of its members and their relationships to one another. Nationally, an estimated 39.9% of households were classified as nuclear couples or uh, one or more parents with children, while 34.2% of households were classified broadly as extended households, a nuclear core combined with other family members such as parents or siblings, and only 2.4% of households were classified as complex, meaning they contained non-related persons. Uh, nuclear households were most common among households with one or two children. Extended households were most common in households with a large number of children, i.e. three children or four 
uh, and more than four children made up 84.5% of that. So, yeah. Um, That's scary. It, it's, yeah, uh, it looks like the stats need to be perceived greater than what I, I have the ability to understand here immediately. But it is scary stats that the, the father figures in South Africa are limited. And uh, I had someone describe this to me as being a... Uh, long-standing systemic issue caused by migrant workers. So you see this most greatly in communities in places like KZN, where fathers were shipped to Johannesburg for mm -hmm. work. So where there were large populations in KZN, it was one of the most population-rich regions of the country pre the uh, settlization of, of the cities here north. Um, and these migrant workers were sent as labor force in the mines, mostly up here yeah. in Khateng. And then they left families behind in case then that they would send money to in order for them to survive. For However, they weren't for a while, or even if they'd continue to, they weren't active members in that family. And then they had second families up here. Yeah, and that's so it created this, it, it's something that created communities of fatherlessness, which uh, cr continued to perpetuate the cycle where even those who weren't migrant workers continued the cycle because it's like, I never had my father figure. These kids don't need their father figure. I'm leaving. It became, cultural. You know, it became a cultural thing. So it's, uh, it was explained to me that way and it made a lot of sense to me. No, I mean, that's that's... And, that's the thing from, you know, segregation, separate, uh, separate uh, land act, you know, then people were being taken from the original home. Like I was speaking to my mom the other day and she was, she was, she lived in Sophia Town and mm. she remembers what it was like. She was still a little girl, but she remembers them being moved from Sofiatown to Soweto, where she eventually grew up. Now, other people were moved out of province, but then the work opportunities were still in Gauteng. So you leave, you come, and you become a minor, right? Mm. Come back home, maybe visit, then, you know, it's a bit difficult. So you send money, like you said, start a second family. And most of them, eventually, they just stopped. Guilt or whatever, right? Mm. But for the children, there's the psychological effect. And you get guys who then start to resent the mother because they think that the mom is the one who's responsible for their father leaving. Um, the other day I was speaking to someone and I was like, I think even with some of these guys, they resent the, the they, they resent their children because I think some men aren't even looking for a an actual like hetero relationship. Mm. I think some guys are looking for surrogate moms. Mm. They're looking for somebody who's going to from an Oedipal. I think that's a. I think that's a. It makes up a small proportion of it, and oh, well, but, I mean, it, but at, I think it is a reality. Yeah, like incels, right? Yeah. I think a lot of incels have an Oedipal view regarding the perspective perspective woman in their mm. life. Right? Mm. They have this unresolved or conflicting um, sexual substitution. Mm. with the woman that they want and their moms, right? Mm. And the reason why some of these guys get to a point where they even leave their kids. I mean, I've heard dudes be like, she paid too much attention on the child. And it's like, maybe, I don't know. That but, sounds good to me. Right? Maybe deep, deep down within you, you know, the, the crevices of your subconscious, you yearn to have that kind of relationship with your old woman, mm. right? You, if you could, if you could suckle from her teeth and consume her breast milk, you would do that. Mm. But you can't. And your child can. So you resent your so child you resent for the attention child. that you that you crave. Right? That, that, for, you, for, that uh, you crave. For getting the attention right? that you crave. And yeah. so you then take it out on your woman as well, and mm. you then abdicate and leave your family. These are things that... Uh, and that's why I say there's a myriad, there are a myriad, you know, uh, of, of issues. There's, there's the multitude of, 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 of things that have happened that, that play to mental health. And that's why I will always advocate for therapy. Go see a therapist, call a lifeline, mm. whatever. Like speak to somebody who's at best got some sort of experience in that. Because I think 
you know, it, going back to the last podcast, you know, we're saying it, it's it, it's not easy. We're, we're seeing a lot of shit, but you've got to you've got to address these issues because tying into you know what I was saying, you got to stop using your depression as a means to run away from taking accountability. Mm. And I think, like last time, people think that accountability means having to whip yourself and beat yourself up, and that's 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 not that's not taking accountability. You know that that that's literally just punishing yourself, and it's counterproductive. Yeah, right. So the whole point of accountability is that it's productive. It's productive to solving the issue. It's productive to taking accountability for my actions in wronging someone allows me to take accountability and then uh, right those wrongs or correct the actions or uh, correct the consequences of those actions. Whereas this this self abuse, the self hate, all of this horrible uh, actions that we take upon ourselves is counterproductive. Substance uh, abuse. Substance abuse is one of these things. And it doesn't actually resolve the issues of accountability. It's it's just sadomasochistic, right? Yeah. That's the the sad thing. It's an endless loop. You drink. So how do you safely take accountability? This is a difficult question to answer, right? Is it obviously it will be case by case, but it's it's quite a difficult thing to Take accountability and and see the negative uh, the negative consequences of of your poor choices or your poor actions or things like this, but then to not hate yourself for those actions, but take honest accountability and in a positive way. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. It's not easy. It, 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 it isn't. It's a gradual process. And I think because we also live in an era of instant gratification, people think, I meditate today, tomorrow I'm Buddha. Mm. Tomorrow I'm Zen. No. It, 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 I used to do, like after the whole effect of the mental breakdown, I actually did some meditation with Buddhist monks. And even they were like, people have this perception that you're going to be meditating in complete silence. And they're like, we've been doing it for years. And we get distracted. But it's about repetition that allows you to get to a point where when you do get distracted, when the negative thoughts do come in, you've got tools now that you know you can use to help get you back on course. So you got to take it one day at a time. You have to be kind to yourself. You've got to learn how to forgive yourself and recognize that, the things that you've done, deplorable or whatever, right? As shameful as it is, it, it does not have to be indicative of who you are. And also recognize that in the journey of healing and growth, it doesn't mean that you're not going to hurt people. It doesn't mean you're not going to do things that might have you disappointed in yourself. You're human at the end of the day. You're going to make mistakes, right? You're going to hurt people. And often, I'd like to believe unintentionally. Mm. But it's in those moments that you got to understand that in taking accountability, you're then able to say to that person, you may not forgive me, but I would like to take this moment to express that I'm sorry. What I did hurt you. And... It wasn't my intention. Or even if it was my intention, I shouldn't have taken things that far, right? And accountability is more for you Mm. than it is for anybody else because how you respond to my apology is on you. I I have no control over that. I can't determine what the outcome is going to be. And if the person doesn't forgive you, you've got to understand that, okay, that's... You're right. I think we we had a discussion earlier before we started recording about repentance and and the Vatican's perception on on repentance and forgiveness being so um, conditional on their terms of uh, accepting God and then the the idea of confession officially mm. official confession through a priest and things like that. But I think accountability is greatly 
motivated by repentance and the, the actual taking of action to the to be accountable for your actions, right? The actual taking of action to right the wrongs or to avoid uh, the, the this poor behavior in future or avoid being this negative person or uh, any of these negative uh, acts that you may have committed is the repentance is such an important part of it and and the individual's ability to accept your apologies um, means far less in my opinion than your individual actions to right those wrongs not necessarily with them but for your own future for your own ability to be, to be better to for growth your own personal growth so I think repentance in my opinion is absolutely the key is that's what allows you to take that positive spin on accountability is that right i used to drink and message women in such a way that i would sexualize them and it would make them feel belittled and whatever what actions do i take to stop that and not necessarily apologize to the people although i'm not saying that you shouldn't apologize to people who have been affected by apologies can be very powerful i think you can apologize to them but their reaction to your apology is far less important than the actions you take to change that behavior and i think that's the important part of accountability is like okay the um me too movement of a few years ago allowed a lot of men to get consequences for their actions yeah. and some of the actions were many years ago which made a lot of men fearful and angry about the movements like this guy did something wrong when he was 16 and now you're taking away his whole career in his 40s that happened years ago forget about it whatever which is debatable right of course it's way worse for a guy who's continuously raped women like a harvey weinstein who goes to prison and loses his career and loses his wealth and whatever whatever, whatever harvey weinstein loses for the horrific acts that he continued to commit for over a long, long, long period of time versus a guy who did something wrong when he was 16 and then in his 40s loses his career over it. That's more debatable. I'm not saying it was wrong or right and maybe and that people shouldn't suffer consequences for things they did in their past. That's not my debate. I'm just talking yeah, about how a- different those two things are. But more importantly is what it allowed is many people, many men in particular to reflect on their actions, for example, and then take accountability and be like, Uh, First of all, I think the first step is fear, right? Is that like what was happening in the Me Too movement, I think a lot of powerful men, mostly men in entertainment, people who were public figures, got themselves to think, oh, damn, what could I get into trouble with? This this was the first thing. It's like, Mm. what what have I done in my past that could get me into trouble? Mm. That was like the first thing, right? That's the first thought. And then it's like, well, maybe I won't get into trouble for it, but now you've thought about it. It's something that you might have forgotten, <laughs> right? Yeah, so now you've thought shit, about it yeah. and it's like, shit, I did do that. Wow. And that wasn't good. Like I didn't perceive it in that way when it happened. But now that I reflect on it as a different person due to growth, you know, yeah. a lot of the time, age brings growth a lot of the time. Sometimes, you know, we can be in a, a uh, I'm forgetting the term, uh, regression, you know, not growth, regression. Um, but it allows us to reflect on these behaviors and then that's where accountability comes into play is like shit what what actions or behaviors that do i continue to do that i think perhaps need to be resolved and that's what true accountability is i think that's the true good tool to accountability is that let's change our actions or let's reflect on the bad things we've done and then change our actions so it's beyond the apologies the the this it's an association to repentance. 100%. I suppose it's weird. Uh, it's weird to call it repentance, but it truly is. Well, is that it's taking actions to no longer do these negative actions, no longer do these negative activities and these toxic actions or toxic negative uh, activities. So I think what you're touching on is being able to discern or identify the difference between remorse and accountability. And I think the thing that has a lot of people running away from accountability is the remorse, Mm. right? Because remorse generally comes with shame. You feel bad for what you've done, but at the same time, taking accountability. And that's why like with with, with AA or Narcotics Anonymous, the 12-step program, part of that is you then have to go to the people who you've wronged Mm. because that's taking accountability. But it's also... You see, AA, 
NA, the thing with Alcoholics Anonymous and, and Narcotics Anonymous is part of the accountability mm. factors. We've now acknowledged the remorse, right? The repentance, the sorrow, the shame. How do we take accountability? We stay sober, right? That's one. Because if you go back to drinking, then you're not taking accountability for your actions. Accountability is acknowledgement of remorse followed through with action. So I recognize when I drink, hmm, Shit, I said some dumb shit last night, man. I fucking said some shit to Marco that I shouldn't have said. <laughs> Yo, Marco, talk, I'm sorry. Mm. That's me showing remorse. Oh, okay, cool. We'll see. Two days later, there I am, fucking drunk again, getting wild and belligerent. Nah, fuck you, Marco, you piece of shit. Do it again. You do tend to say that when you're drunk around me. <laughs> I come back. <laughs> Fuck you, Mark. You piece of shit. No. I come back, never said that to me. I come back and I apologize. Mm. If I keep doing that, then the reality is, is I could genuinely be sorry for what I've done in the moment, but I'm not taking accountability. Mm. So I've got to stop, right? And now you've stopped. And that's why they'll say, now you've got to go back and show true remorse. Mm. Go and apologize. You're acknowledging what you've done. Consequences and repercussions, depending on what we've done, right? Mm. Going back to like what you were talking now, talking about now regarding um, the Me Too movement, mm. the, regarding on our transgressions, right? The levels that they're at. Yeah, I'm 16. I did some dumb shit. Mm. I come back and apologize, right? And I've taken accountability. It's something that I don't repeat that you know it comes back to bite me in the ass when i'm 40 and we're like yeah we can we can we can debate you know around that and if i should be punished for it but again you know consequences and repercussions and there's no timeline on that you know it's not the court of law where double jeopardy comes into play because you literally had to at least go to court for that but i think the thing is is that's the other reason why people are afraid of, 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 of accountability, the repercussions, the consequences. And like, fuck, dude, I'm no fucking angel. Mm. I'm just a, a guy who's trying to do a little bit better. Mm. And doesn't mean that I'm not going to mess up. That, mm. that I've hurt people. And I, like, there's one woman who I hurt. I've hurt a couple. Like, I've been an ass, mm. right? And I apologized. Like a year later, because it was eating me up. I felt remorse. And so I messaged her to say, I want you to know that it wasn't you. I was the problem. And she turned around and she said to me, you know, thank you. I really needed to hear that from you. And I appreciate your apology and I forgive you. And that was the last time she spoke to me. Because mm. I messaged her like, I think maybe like a year later, you know. Not expecting friendship from her. She didn't even open my message, man. Mm. Like she didn't even bother to open my message. She had the full closure that she She got her closure. And you know what? I had to accept that. I was like, mm. well... Uh, and then there's the fear that the idea that that is a manipulation, right? Is the idea is that you're trying to win her back, and that's why you came and apologized for the thing. I think that's that's one of the fear factors is how many people use these tools as a manipulation and, to win people back. And, and to that point, at the end of the day, that's the truly. If your intention is truly to be accountable and remorseful, right? It's not a manipulation, if, right? If yeah. you perceive my apology to be manipulation and you think I'm using it to track it back into your life, get back into your pants. That's, that's on you. I've 
Done. Yeah, of course. And it's not, but truly it's not actually on them. It's because of the the toxicity of community in general, where how often it's either happened to them or people they know and the idea that- No, true. That, I'm that's just saying that's your on. choice. Or You're choosing that. the other factor is that you get a lot of this sort of thing is, uh, you know, the, the ballet mom saying, don't worry, baby, they just say that to you because they're jealous of you. And uh, it's also this delusion of grandeur is that the only reason anyone apologizes to you is not because of themselves, but rather because they want you back because you're so fantastic, whatever. So that's the other side of that. Um, a lot of the times we're hurting people in the way that you've discussed is while we're depressed. This is one of the biggest things is when you're in a state of turmoil internally, you take chaos and turmoil out into the world. And hurt it's this idea people. of insecurities and fears uh, manifesting during depression. Oh yeah, hurt people, hurt people. Mm. And that's the thing, like, by and large, a lot of the people that I've hurt, I did that in a in a, in a place where I was depressed. Mm. Um, some of the stuff that's happened to me, man, you know, uh, things that have happened, the betrayal that I've experienced from very close people, right. um, people that I loved. I also know that they were depressed. And I was, a conversation I had with a friend the other day was, one of the hardest things to reconcile is that a person's actions, negative actions done to you, you feel the betrayal. It's happening to you. You've betrayed me. But you betrayed yourself more than you did me. And at some point, I need to come to that acceptance. That's how I have to let go of the trauma. And that the I'm not the and true the victim that in this. This isn't actually about me. Mm. Because, trust me, I know, I understand. It's very easy to get hurt and then mm. feel like that dejection, that rejection, mm. that betrayal mm. is indicative of me. I'm not worthy. You hurt me. You did this because I'm not good enough. No, 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 no. You did this because you felt that you weren't good enough. And sadly, I am, as they say, a uh, casualty of war. I'm a casualty of your mm. inner war. Mm. I think you're absolutely right. And it's so indicative of human beings. It's so much of what we live every day is the idea of walking through a shopping mall with a pimple in your face and obsessing over why everyone's looking at you from your own internal thing. And we're always thinking that everyone's paying attention to us. Everyone's paying attention to me. What does that mean for me? And human beings, we're programmed about me, 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 me. And we're so concerned with how other people perceive us without even thinking to ourselves, people don't give a shit about you. People aren't thinking about you. And even your closest people aren't thinking about you. Everyone's thinking about you in relation to them. And that's how the human brain works. And if we all just think like that, and, and the easiest way to think, and the easiest way to describe this is for you to honestly look at yourself and ask yourself, do I think about other people? And it's like, no, you're self-centered. You you think about yourself constantly. And when you see another person, you think about them in the way of, that it relates to you. It's all your own experiences of that human being. It's all, when you see a person and they're like, that person greeted me shitty today or they said something. Like, you don't think, did he have a shitty day? It's about what did I do to deserve that shitty greeting? That is how our default, that's our default setting. I'm not saying you need to try escape from that. That's just human beings. We think about ourselves. But the, you looking at your own behavior in that way allows you to see why other people are like not paying attention to you. They're just simply not. It's it's as simple it's as simple as it is I'm, I may be oversimplifying there are states and no. scenarios where you are thinking about other people and you are genuinely concerned about what's going on with yeah, their internals yeah. and things like that but most of the time it's just about how that dynamic translates to you how it affects you it's the impression of you your impression of you what's going on with you it's how i look not worried about how they look and even if you are worrying about how someone else looks it's like why don't i look like that or why do they look like that? Do I look good enough to be represented by someone who looks like that? Me, 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 and me. You see, it goes to a conversation I had with my friend, Natasha, um, and a couple of other people. But everyone wants to believe that they're special, right? Mommy is little star, mm. special little boy, special little girl, right? You're the star of your movie. Mm. And rightfully so. It's mm. your life. You're the star. 
problem is, is then thinking that you're Truman and this is the Truman show mm. and that you are the star and everybody is playing in the movie of your life. Everybody's just the featured extra or a co-star in the, you know. Good movie, by the way, if you haven't oh, seen yeah, it. Yeah, it's not a damn good movie. But the thing is, is that sometimes you got to understand that, you know, someone used to say, there's a saying, it's like, it comes from hip hop, like, charge it to the game. Sometimes, and that's difficult because it, or, or the movie Layer Cake, I don't know if you've ever seen Layer Cake, but there's, there's like, don't take it personal, it's is, just is business. That the, is that the, the, it's just come on to Netflix, it's a British gangster show. Yeah, movie, the, yeah. British yeah. gangster Daniel movie, Daniel right? Craig's, I'd like to believe, audition to get the role of James Bond. But right. there's a scene where some shit goes down, right? And the guy's like, don't take it personal, it's just business. And that's the thing. It's, fucking hard to not take shit personally because that's our default you've done it to me it's mm. like what do you mean don't take it personally right and that's business now imagine when it's when it actually personal. is personal we're friends we're lovers but you've been trade me and the thing is is you have to say to yourself in order to move on and i'm not saying don't feel the hurt you're human, you will. You'll feel betrayed. You'll feel angry. But to let go of that, for your peace of mind, for your mental health, in order for you to be able to get past that, not to absorb that trauma and then internalize it and, and, and then dish it out to the next person because hurt people mm. hurt people, you need to get to a point where you're able to say, don't take it personal because it had nothing to do with me. Those are your demons. Those are your issues. Those are your scars. That's your internal war. And sadly, you couldn't fight enough for yourself to see the value that I possess. And unfortunately, you lost a good person in your life. And I've had to have that conversation when I've done people wrong. To be like, yeah, I lost a good person in my life. Because at the time when I wronged them, I was going through my internal issues. And I then outwardly projected what was happening internally. Mm. And I didn't have enough faculties to recognize why I shouldn't do this to this person and vice versa. So, cool, you've lost a friend, you've lost a lover, you've lost whatever it is in me. That's the thing. I can get to the point now where I don't take it personal. Right, I recognize Marco betrayed me because Marco's going through his own issues. So, cool. I separate myself and I distance myself. Problem becomes, you come and apologize. You think your apology is going to mean we get back to being friends. And that's the thing with accountability, is understanding that at the end of the day, once you've taken accountability, the cards will fall where they lay. Maybe the person does take you back and you guys can rekindle your friendship or your relationship. And other times they'll tell you, thank you, I forgive you. And that's it. And other times they'll tell you, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Whatever the outcome is, man, you got to understand that you really can't take it personally. <laughs> you can't. I feel personally attacked. <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right. Now, sorry to go all Freudian on you. Uh, let's go back to where we were earlier in talking about men who replace their mothers with their partners. Uh, according to eHarmony, because we all trust them so much, the dating site, men are looking for a nurturer, not a mother. Thanks, eHarmony. Uh, the mirror.co.uk, the British mirror, uh, have a study by dating site eHarmony again, once again, found that 64% of men go for women with the same personality traits, uh, personality traits rather, as their mums. Uh, but more importantly than eHarmony and their fucking pseudo psychology, uh, there's a article here in psychologytoday.com. You can always find it quite easily yourself. Uh, talking about when men are boys and wives are mothers and saying that there's shared responsibility between both parties and it's often a slow development in a relationship where women become a mother figure to men who become children figures 
in the relationship. <laughs> and uh, it, it can start at points where a woman has asked their husbands to grow up and try to remove them from their toxic friendships and say, before you go see your friends, we need to do this, uh, which is a very, if you have a mother like mine, you, you know that feeling. Um, and then women who, who take that action and do become caregivers, they, they need to take some of the responsibility for that. Um, so there's a warning here in psychology today to uh, recognize the roots of these behaviors and not allowing them to envelop your relationship and grow long term. So there you go. Just a little bit of um, a re-return. And then to get Freudian on you is we've been talking about depression and we've been talking about the existential dread and the anxieties and the psychological problems of men. And, uh, you know, Freud would tell us it's all because we didn't have sex with our mothers that we wanted to do when we were younger. Um, but the reality is mental health is impacted by sex, especially with men. And a lack of sex can cause mental health issues and uh, mental health behavior. And like, I think Andrew Tate wouldn't have a following at all on his social media platforms if all young men were getting laid. And I think oh, <laughs> a lot of his following is from young men who can't get laid at, at all. And uh, I think that he's created a business on this. Okay. The reality of it. Um, yeah. And uh, that's my own personal opinion. Oh, no, no, if no, young no. men were, were engaging in sex as regular, and there's a big statistic actually out there about men in their 20s having less regular sexual oh, yeah. inter intercourse than men in their 40s, um, yeah, the which is the, the first time of, in history but in a long time. It's a coincidence that the growth of incels is also seeing the decrease of, of, of young men's sexual activity. Mm, mm, mm. So uh, what do you do? When depression takes hold of your sex drive. Okay, There's so the first, I just want to address the first point. Right? Please go back. The to reason that. why I laughed remind me of this 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 post I saw on Facebook. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine put up where this this woman chose to be anonymous was going on about how she basically does everything in the house, mm. right? Mm, mm. But now she was out of the house. I don't know if she was at work or whatever, but she wasn't home, and it started raining. So she comes home and she asks her husband, did you like, why didn't you take the clothes off the washing line? Because when she got home, she sees the clothes are now on the floor, on the ground, and obviously wet and dirty. Mm. And he's like, nah, I'm a man. That's not my role. That's not what I'm supposed to do. Mm. And that's where I essentially cracked the joke of these guys want surrogate moms. Mm. And if they could, they would even suck the milk their wife's teat mm. and resent their kids. Um, now, the Andrew Tate thing, 100%. I think, you know, guys like him for the incels, right? For the average, average guy, they look at an Andrew and it's like, I wish I could be him. So they put him up as this savior. Mm. But what they don't realize is you never heard of Andrew Tate until he was driving his Bugatti. He mm. waited to get all the shit that he's got and then jumped onto his platform. You living in your mom's basement, you who doesn't have a set steady payment, you who has their father paying for their cell phone contract, you whose girlfriend is the one that has the car. Mm. You can't speak like Andrew Tate. I don't agree with Andrew Tate, but you can't speak like Andrew Tate. At least you Andrew, really can't. At least Andrew Tate. Andrew uh, can be like. Uh, at least it's arguable when it's Andrew Tate. With yeah. you, you can't even argue it. Because You're so the, far away. Because with Andrew Tate, at the end of the day, it's like, yo, man, I got the money. I've got this, that, and the third. And the woman that get with me, they straight up, they know what they're signing up for, right? I'm telling them that this is the dynamic, and I've got the money, and I've got. The lifestyle that I can mm. provide. Besides his rape allegations, motherfucker. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I, didn't know, I, did, I didn't know about that. But yeah. you, you know, fucking Umberto, Pedro, <laughs> fucking Tabo, yeah. whoa, Jacob, whoa, 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 and whoa. whoever else, right? You can't, as an ordinary average ass motherfucker, think that you now somehow be like, yeah, Andrew Tate said, Andrew Tate's a millionaire. He drives a, he drives a 32 million rand car excluding import and tax. So I just needed to say that. 
depression in sex. And yes, uh, that, there's a, I don't know, have you ever seen the movie Human Traffic? Uh, no, I've not oh, seen it. I've heard about it. It's a classic, man. It's one of my favorite fucking movies. It is like... Is the, it the British film where they Welch. follow each individual person's story? So it's like a, a multi-story British film, am I right? Yeah, it's Welsh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, it's Welsh. Right. So it's, 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 well, I guess, yeah, British. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um... United Kingdom. Mm, mm. It's, uh, it's, a uh, it's a movie about a group of youths mm. who the weekend is coming, it's time to go and party, right? Mm. And... Right, I have seen this. And, and, um, you know, it's 90s, man. You know, the rave mm, era. Mm. And uh, it's like the lighthearted comedic equivalent of train spotting, where train spotting was like, you know, yes, right. And right. it's funny, but, but it, was it was also heavy. like heavy. Yeah. This one was like, yo, it's just. Okay, wait, insert human traffic meme gif over here of the uh, the the guy working in the record store. Yeah, Jim, giving, no, uh, giving, Jim's the, the main character. Giving the drum and bass heads. The cool. jungle, the the, yeah. the Tarzan and Jane of jungle Tarzan just swung in on the yeah, vein yeah, this yeah. morning. Yeah. <laughs> you got any jungling guy? <laughs> any jungling guy? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. The coop, coop, yeah. coop and chip. So there's a scene where they're in a lecture and they're talking about the effects of like ecstasy and all of that, right? And uh, they break the fourth wall and then, you know, talking about how like it can affect your sex drive. Uh, and build up to that, Jips got like a retort for everything that they're saying, you know, about mm. ecstasy and coke and the effects of drugs on the brain and whatnot. And then they're like, and it can, you know, cause erectile dysfunction. And he's just like, Ugh. you should. Like, he looks away from the camera. Like, right? oh, I don't have a retort for that. And here's the thing about depression, bro. Like, it is that like, it's like drugs mm. in that regard. It 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 can have that effect on you. And as a man where there's so much external and internal pressure, mm. right? Uh, regarding your virility, regarding mm. your performance. I'm not even talking about size. Mm. As men, there's, there's, there's so much that is connected to our essence and being mm. that has to do with our penis, right? With the little man. <laughs> yeah. Now, when that ceases to work because you're so and I'm like I'm gonna be I'm gonna be very open to the young brothers and any other brother really who's going through depression and you find yourself struggling in the bedroom, you can't get it up. There's two things that can happen. You will put yourself in a position where you pressure yourself to hook up with someone because there's some stuff that's going wrong downstairs mm. and you kind of feel like, nah, you know, let me just, it's all in my head. I can get it right with her. I've always wanted to hook up with her. Mm. And then you start, you know, getting hot and heavy. And then you're like, ha my man's is standing to attention. He's showed up to the party. And then all of a sudden, just as it's about to happen, motherfucker decides to switch Oh, Because of the pressure. Right? Because of the pressure. All kinds of oh, stuff. the pressure. Right? And then that becomes a whole other kind of conversation that right. you have with yourself. And then people develop a reliance on drugs, not necessarily erection drugs like Viagra or whatever, which you, you can. Uh, so there's a connection between uh, what they call uh, recreational uh, erection drugs use and its connection with psychological ED. So what 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 you're describing is psychological yeah. erectile dysfunction. Uh, and the, the connection that then forms with drug usage and then people who like, if I just relax, if I have a couple drinks, it'll work because I get out of my own head. Marijuana, big one. You know, it's like, Unless, do a few know, and then I get out of my paranoia head. Paranoia kicks in. And then the paranoia makes it worse, right? <laughs> like, but people become reliant on certain drugs in order to be able to perform at all. And it's right? a Because of the psychological is the catch-22. It becomes right? a catch-22. Yeah. So you rely on the drugs because the drugs free you but um, then the drugs, a little to get, mm. you know, aroused and lose your inhibitions. But then eventually the drugs become part of the actual of physical the impact, physic the yes, physiological to issue why on you. you now can't. can't. Yeah. And then Especially without it. So when you're talking about like 
drugs like Viagra, et cetera, is that uh, what it, the, the cause of the psychological ED, for example, the phenomenon is that where men experiment with Viagra, for example, as an electro- erectile dysfunction drug, use it recreationally. Uh, so it's not necessarily prescribed and necessarily necessary in their usage. And then they become reliant on it psychologically, even though there's been no physiological change in their ability to get an erection. They get fearful of being able to achieve an erection without the drugs. So so this is my thing, is that you can find yourself in this, this rather, you know, very uncomfortable loop Mm. of relying on something and all of that in a way to try avoid the conversation because you'll ask yourself what does this mean does it mean i couldn't get it up you know am i gay then you have that no, fucking fuck. conversation <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is a lot of guys don't want to have these conversations right. right and the reality is as it fucking happens you sit down you speak with guys and it's be like yeah you've had the fucking conversation right erectile dysfunction it happens mm. you don't need to beat yourself up over it you, I think the moment you, you do go through it, that's where you need to maybe remove yourself from dealing with women. Not because you're gay, and there's nothing wrong with that, but because... Maybe you're gay, dude. Just... <laughs> maybe. But maybe because you need to remove yourself from women because you're going to put yourself... You're going to be like, okay, I failed with her, but I'll try again. Mm. Then you fail. Then the it's extra like, pressure. Then there's the extra pressure. It's like, okay, maybe it's her, not me. Maybe I'm just not all the way attracted to her. So you go and you try with another Sounds woman. Sounds logical. Right? Yeah. Then you try with another woman. Mm. And then it happens with her. And then all of a sudden, there's this chaotic conversation that starts happening. So you... You do whatever it is to try and run away from it. And that's what I'm saying. If you find yourself, whoever is listening, you find yourself in a point where you are going through ED. And I wish someone had told me this when I was a young brother going through that because I was depressed and I didn't realize that part of depression, the effects can be ED. Stop talking to women. Go seek some help. Go Go, go talk to a therapist, right? And recognize that depression, though mental, does have physical effects. And for a man, part of those physical effects are erectile, dis- is erectile dysfunction uh, disorder, right? Mm. It's, it happens. And it happens to a lot more guys than you think. Some of your favorites, some of your biggest idols and stars and celebs, they've gone through it as well. They're just not going to talk about it because society and ourselves as men as well, we've put so much pressure on being this big dick daddy who's just constant. doesn't matter. You could do a work shift 18 hours, come home, and you still And a light breeze gives it to, to you, bro. just Woo! knock it out the park. Just Let's just, go. Porn star. And it's like, sometimes you don't want to, and it's okay. Sometimes you're too tired, and that's okay. And sometimes you're so mentally fatigued mm. that it's just not going to happen, and that's okay. And that's not an insult to the woman that you're with. Please, and it ladies, isn't. don't feel insulted if a yes, guy can't get it can, up with you. It's not your fault. Woman, Please stop uh, buying into this idea that men are always horny, and they're always prepared to do it. and well, they're always, always fucking uh, horny. You know, and that if you get turned down, there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with yeah, you. Uh, honestly, ladies... It's not about you. It's not about you. It really is. Like, this is turning back to that discussion we had. It's not about you. Nothing is about you it's not about ever. You. Nothing. No. Everything's always about the person involved. The, nothing's it, about you. Like this one, this isn't the, 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 the played out corny, it's not you, it's me shit. This is legit. Not yeah, you. Not you. It's physically, literally. And me, psychologically. And psychologically, yeah, it's, it's me. me. Yeah. So the last thing that I need is for you to make me feel even guiltier. And that's what I love about human traffic. Mm. I won't, for those who haven't watched it, spoil. Spoiler. But the end, right? And I'm just like, La, empathy la, la, goes la, a long la, way. La, 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 <laughs> empathy la, 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 goes a long la, la, way. That's 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 what I'll say. Empathy it does go a long way. Empathy really does go a long way. So 
to those with to the whole thing of dealing with 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 the, with your you know lack of sex drive or uh, uh, erectile dysfunction while going through depression i will say again practice a little kindness towards yourself be empathetic towards yourself and understand that it's a lot more common than you would think because i know somewhere out there there is a guy who's torturing himself because of this and it's like yo bro like it happens and you know what like the sun goes down the sun comes up mm. it rises and so shall the man <laughs> 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 it will come back to worry, will, guys. Man. It will. I think that's a good way to wrap this up. Uh, <laughs> our discussion broadly, slightly less so than last time, was around mental health. Um, it was a little more fun and a little more lighthearted this time. But just to finish off on the serious notes, and it's a stat that I wanted to bring up in the previous podcast and it's something we discussed now, is that according to the NIH.gov website, uh, an article from 2016, so slightly outdated, however, I think still relevant, um, is that South Africa was a country with a population of approximately 53 million at the time, we, as we spoke about earlier, it's nearly 60 million now. Uh, a, a population of approximately 53 million people is served by a whopping 10,961 registered psychologists. Mm -hmm. 10,961 registered psychologists for 53 million people. And 799 psychiatrists, which now is not pumping up those numbers really nicely. Uh, it's, you know, we, we're doomed to fail with numbers like then that. Then we've still got to look at LSM, demographics. Of course. And majority who can of afford those, right? how many of them are in private practice oh, oh yeah. and Be how many of them are Because a practicing therapist, man, a psychologist, is if you've ever gone for therapy, you know it's not cheap. So where are you most likely going to find them? You're going to find mm. them in the suburban areas, right? Unless they work for some government clinic. Or well, doing a, a total of the clinical psychologists, uh, including community service clinical psychologists, uh, 487 are, are categorized as African uh, in total. 367 of those female, only 120 male African clinical psychologists in South Africa. Uh, 109 are colored, 154 are Indian. Uh, 591 have a uh, categorization of none, uh, where they've obviously chosen not to give their, their racial categorization. And 1,624 are white. I have to assume that a lot of those 591 nuns are white, where they're like, fuck that, you don't need to know my race. <laughs> That's such a white people yes thing to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I know that because I've hey, said that before myself. Hey, you Fuck it. you, you don't know. <laughs> you yeah. don't even know. Categorize me as none. Anyway, and then uh, counseling psychology. So these are not clinical psychologists, but counselors. There's a whopping total number of 1,652, of which 153 are African. Disgraceful numbers. But anyway. the translation... The people who need it most, who need therapy the most, mm. right? Those living in abject poverty, because we know that just aesthetically, your conditions, the reason why it's important to live in a clean place, the reason why, you know, you, when you're a kid, you think your mom is on your ass about cleaning up your room. Mm. Like, yes, yeah, obviously, but it's, it's good for your psychology, right? but it's also good for. Mental, mental health. health, right? Mm. If you are living in and structure and systems, right? And and exactly. uh, it's one of the things that comes up regularly in in uh, uh, trials for um, custody, like in in custody trials, is who's, like who's, who gives the most structure, exactly? Which household has the most structure? Like exactly. you wake, what time do you wake up at mom's house? Eight a.m. every time we wake up at eight a.m. or dad's whatever, house. you know, dad's whenever. house whenever. Whenever dad wakes up. Okay. Already. That's a big no-no. So, so these yeah. are the things, right? Now, it, just aesthetically, mm, mm. It, 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 it's, the, it's the same reason why you look at some of the European countries and their approach now to prison reform, mm. where they're like, okay, we're not going to follow the American model. We just put guys in these cages and there's like 50 of you. We're actually going to give you a decent setup because this is more conducive to reform right you're not waking up in 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 in, in like hell mm. and sharing the shitter with six other guys yeah right like if you look at the more scandinavian countries they've even been like 
two guys a saw, one guy a saw, and there's a library and TV and pool table. And eventually these guys, the the, the, the rate of um, repeat offenders is like arguably the lowest in you in the world. So one thing studies have shown is when people are growing up in abject poverty and it's just squalor all around, if what you're taking in on a daily is just violence and mm. shambles, symbolic, you know, st- uh, structural dynamics, broken windows, fucking walls are falling apart, the roof and mm. all of that stuff. That's going to have a, a direct impact. effect mm. on you psychologically. You're going to internalize that and you're going to process that as my environment is equivalent to me, how I am. And so you start to mirror your surroundings. You start to mirror where you live, right? Mm. So psychologically, you're going to act out. Mm. And that's why you will find that the poor will end up committing more violent crime than those who are living in a higher Right. In, in a higher LSM. Yeah, beyond the, the necessity of committing crime so the tran- for income and survival, exactly. it's also so the psychological tra- So the impact. translation of what you said basically is the people who need, you know, mental health assistance more than most don't have access don't to it. Don't have access mm. to it. And that's terrifying. And this conversation is terrifying. It is a Friday for us. For you, however, you're watching it whenever you're watching it or listening to it whenever you're listening to it. Gukle, let's wrap this bitch up. Any parting words? Um, yeah, man. Like, you know, just be empathetic. Lifeline. Uh, Google them. Mm. Free therapy. Um, if you are using drugs, alcohol, whatever it is be honest with yourself about your relationship with these substances it's scary but look i haven't even been to aa but go to aa if you if you'll know if you need to go to aa because the conversation you have with yourself will tell you right and na but be kind to yourself be empathetic to yourself and remember that accountability doesn't mean that you got to beat yourself up don't beat yourself up. This has been a Marco Martin's Revolution episode. Gukle Nkosi, thank you so much for joining me once again. He will be back again because I just love these conversations. And you've been listening to us for long enough. If you do want to have a podcast that looks, sounds, and perhaps the content is slightly different, hopefully, uh, and feels just like this one, be sure to go to podcasttv.com forward slash revolution, which is of a discount on your first order of a podcast or podcast series. For me, for now, it's goodbye.